Good morning. My name is Marvin, and I will be your conference operator today. At this time, I would like to welcome everyone to the Leadership Selling Skills, Responding to Objection, and Closing the Sale conference call. Thank you. Ms. Contini, you may begin your conference. Why, thank you very much. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to this Leadership Selling Skills course. Responding to objections and closing the sale. For those of you whom I have had the pleasure of being in the classroom with before, I see many familiar names. I'm really excited to have you back again. And for those of you whom I've not yet met, welcome. I also want to introduce Christopher, who's here with me this morning. How are you this morning, Chris? Great. Thanks a lot, Lisa. It is nice and early here for Chris and I, but we are uh, we're on top of our game, as I like to say. Now, most of you, in fact, everybody should have received an electronic workbook as we like to call it, and if you have printed that out, you may want to have it handy. If you have not printed out the workbook, I do recommend that you have some blank paper and a pencil handy for a couple of um, exercises we'll be doing in, in case, well, gosh, who knows, maybe I'll say something brilliant and you want to take some notes. You never know. This course is highly interactive for those of you who have not participated with me before, so it's um, it's recommended that you pay attention and, and get involved and practice, practice, practice when we, are, when we have opportunities in the session today. Re the tactics and skills we're going to be learning for responding to objections and next week for closing require practice. You don't want to try them cold. So that's why we're having the session today and next week as well. I want to give you an overview of the program, but before I do that, Let's just review a few of the logistics for utilizing the virtual classroom. So first of all, please remember that your um, line, phone lines will be open and will stay open for the entire time that we're together. So what that means is if you have some background noise, you want to mute your phone. If you don't have a mute button on your own telephone, you can press star six to mute your phone. When I call on you or when you raise your hand, you'll need to push star six to unmute. If you're sitting in a quiet office and you don't anticipate any interruptions, go ahead and leave your phone line open. However, please don't put us on hold, because if you put us on hold, then we may hear that horrible background music. You don't want that to happen. If for something happens to your phone line and something's not working, you can always hang up and call back in. If you need some assistance during the call, simply dial star zero, and an operator will put you in a private conference and help you. Also, if you need to step away from your desk for a moment, please do put yourself offline. You'll notice that there is an offline box at the bottom left-hand side of your screen underneath the list of the folks that are participating here with us today. Now, this is important. Raise your hand any time, any time, and I will call on you. Of course, those of you that have been in class with me before know that even if you don't raise your hand, if I haven't heard from you in a while, I likely will call on you just to see what's up see how you're doing, and uh, make sure that you're engaged with us and that things are making sense for you. Today's session will run no longer than two hours. It may be a little bit longer some of the content and updated it some, and so this is the, you're getting the new improved version. So um, that should be good for you. I've noticed some people hitting their applause buttons. Oh my gosh, am I doing that, that well already? That's fine. You can hit them. That doesn't bother me. Um, all right. For those of you that have not met me, Here's just a little bit about me so you know what, where all this information is coming from. The name of our company is called Synergy. My name is Lisa Contini. I'm the principal of the company. I have 20 years experience in sales. I would say that's not counting selling Girl Scout cookies, which I did do for a couple of years in my early career. But I did start Synergy in 1989, and we have evolved our sales approach over the years in response to the market and in response to the buying habits of enterprise customers. We are experts in shifting and helping people shift from a product solution focus to a business solution focus, something I know that you have heard a lot about and will continue hearing a lot about. And I think that's because if you don't make this shift, what you'll realize is that in the end, you'll be forced to either get a different job or finally in the end change your behaviors. Now, I, I say that, and it may sound sort of strong, Many people, particularly in the PSG space, are still being successful, and, and it seems as though in your, in your experiences perhaps that a lot of the sales focus is still on the product and on the solution itself. However, one of the things we're going to talk about today is that part of that has to do with who it is that you're talking to in the sales process. And to the extent possible, 
we need to be elevating ourselves and HP higher up in the organization earlier in the sales process so that we can be a part of the conversations with the executives that, that relate to the greater business issues. So part of this shift and making the shift from having a, from a product solution focused sales motion, if you will, to more of a business solution sales focus, part of that shift includes how you respond to objections, how you move a sale to a close. So let's take a look at what it is that we are going to be covering today. So in today's session, we are going to start with a brief overview of leadership selling in terms of the approach. And again, I know that many of you have participated in that class, so it will be a review of that for those of you that have and those of you that have not. It will be important for you to understand where these tactics are coming from or the basis for the tactics that we'll be learning. Then we're going to get into what I call responding to in competitive inquiries. Now, competitive inquiries is, is the term that I have given to those objections that we hear early on in the sales process versus objections that you hear later on in the sales process, which we'll be getting into those too. We're going to learn that objections are not your problem. Yay! Isn't that great? It's actually not your responsibility to solve the customer's issues. So we're going to be talking about that. As well as we get more into objections, you're going to be learning about the four classifications of objections and what type of information a customer typically needs in order for them to be able to solve their issues in each of these classifications. And part of that is a four-step process for responding effectively to objections. And in fact, this four-step process I provided you a very brief overview of in the very last session of Leadership Selling Skills for those of you that did participate in that class. At this point, I have a question for you. I don't have a hands-up slide for those of you that are familiar with my hands-up slides. So I'm just going to ask you to go ahead and raise your hand, even though there isn't one of those slides saying raise your hand. But my question to you is this. What are the challenges that you're experiencing right now with responding to customer objections? Oh, there was a name and then it went down. Okay, now let me remind you that every time you raise your hand and we interact, you earn a dollar. For those of you that have not been in our trading before, this is sort of a fun game we play. Jim, what's up? You keep raising your hand and then putting it down. Just Jim? trying to earn a dollar. Well, then get you that hand up there and let's talk. You didn't say I had to answer the question. Uh, uh, no, you didn't listen. I said for everybody that raises their hand and we interact. So, but Jim, what are some of the challenges that you face in responding to your customer objection? Well, the, the biggest issue, particularly on the PSG side of the house, is features. You know, it's, your competition has this for X amount of dollars. What are you going to do? Give me more for the same amount of dollars. And typically, who is it that you're having that conversation with? Probably the technical evaluators. And we're, one of the things we're going to talk about today is the fact that you hear different objections from different levels of people. And while the, many of the tactics are the same, our, expect, our expectations for the response that we get um, need to be somewhat um, uh, realigned depending on who it is we're talking to. So I hear you, uh, Jim, definitely. The technology is such that no matter how quickly HP comes up with some sort of you know, new and greatest, latest feature, the competition is going to have it the next minute, which is going to, of course, put the customer in a position where they're going to say, well, you know, Dell can do this for me. Can you do that or better? Thank you. That's a great example. Larry, Larry Slack, welcome this morning. Hey, good morning, Lisa. How are you doing? I'm doing well, thank you. Did you, did you want to add something to this discussion of responding to objections? Well, I want to earn my dollar. Yes, I do. <laughs> good for you. So uh, I think the two things that I face more often are, you know, pricing and availability of products. Pricing and availability. So tell me what it is that the customer says regarding availability. Oh, it's one of these things like I'd like to order it and get it shipped within the week, and we can't always fulfill on that uh, commitment. Okay. So there, there are uh, the objection would be, gee, I'd like to do business with you, but you can't get me the, the equipment as fast as I need it. Absolutely. Okay. And, and then sometimes our internal processes make it very uh, sales preventive. I, I hear that, too. And, and in fact, in many cases, there are two sales processes going on, the one with the customer and then the one internally. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you for that. John. Yeah, I guess uh, the, uh, we just led into that, which is often my object, customer objections are in HP's failure to execute on business fundamentals. Can you tell so, me a little bit more about that? 
you know, you know, recently we've gone through a very difficult migration of uh, ERP systems, and we've been unable to deliver product, and we've been unable to communicate ETAs. And although these problems are being worked on are temporary, um, often our customers' objections in doing business with HP is the difficulty in doing business, the difficulty getting business fundamental information compared to our competitors. And I guess the reason I ask that question is one of the things you brought up is the objections are more of our customers' problems than ours, and I'm wondering if that applies to internal HP shortfalls also. Well, when I, when I say that, I'm going to define that a little bit, bit more later, John. What I mean is, um, so I'm going to say something now, I'll probably repeat it a little bit later, but the customer is the one who's making the buying decision. The customer is the one that's spending their money. If the customer typically... You know, the way that I, that I, the phraseology I often use is the customer is the one that's objecting to doing business with HP. I'm not objecting to them doing business with us. You may not be objecting to them doing business with us. So part of this is a, is a uh, mental, mental positioning because too often what happens is, and this is a good example, for you, John, and for others who have been experiencing the internal frustrations of the uh, of HP not being able to execute on some of the business fundamentals, your own frustrations can sometimes actually be reflected onto the customer without you perhaps even knowing it. So these are some of the different things we're going to be talking about, which is you know, separating my, perhaps if I'm a salesperson, my objections from the customer's objections, but recognizing that if you take the responsibility for solving all of the problems for the customer, what I believe you'll see by the end of the day is that of today's session is that you are actually getting in the way of them making their decisions swiftly. And in some cases, we're mucking up the water. Does that make sense sort of theoretically, at least at this point, John? Um, I'll stand by until you go further into it. Okay. I appreciate that. Marsha Kessel, I noticed your hand was up. Marsha, how are you today? I'm fine, Lisa. Good morning. Good morning. Marsha, guess what? What? We were sitting here, we noticed that you were the first person that logged on, and Christopher said, Christopher, what did you say? I said, uh, well, she gets a dollar, she's the first one that signed on. I said, I think you're right. So, Marsha, you had a buck coming into this thing. Well, thank you. It's more that if I don't do it then, I may forget when the time comes. So, so Marsha, tell us about some of the challenges you have in responding to customer objections. Well, I think when you're dealing with customers who aren't buying HP, it's very difficult because they need a compelling reason to make a change in vendor. Yes. And that's a very hard message to get across to a company where their existing uh, PSG vendor or whatever may be very well seated because there is a cost associated with making that change. Sure, there definitely is. And you, you, make, you make a good point um, that they need a compelling reason. There needs to be a compelling business reason. And, Marsha, you probably remember that from leadership selling skills. That, that's sort of the key um, things that we talked about and in the review we're, we're going to in, in the leadership selling um, approach overview we're going to review that which is we as HP cannot make somebody have a compelling business event they, they either have one or they don't and so really the key is more learning the right questions to ask to be able to, to understand and hear that compelling business event but some of our frustrations around responding to objections and, and getting past them is something like if a customer says, I have no business reason to change and do business with you. You know what? That may be right. So sometimes I think, Marsha, and this goes for everybody, when we hear, you know, responding to objections, and you'll notice I call it responding to objections, not overcoming objections, the, the assumption there is, oh, okay, I'm going to now learn the, the magic thing that I can say that's going to have the customer all of a sudden decide that they do have a business reason or I'm, or I'm going to learn these magic words and if I say this sentence or if I use this script, then the customer all of a sudden is going to realize that availability really isn't an issue. And that, you know, it doesn't work that way. And I think you, you know that. So um, that said, I, you're right. Customers who are comfortable where they are now and probably what you've noticed, Marcia, and other people have as well, people that customers that have a long-term relationship with a current supplier, even if things aren't perfect, the risks and time associated with making a change are sometimes too overwhelming for them. Hopefully what you get out of this class and next session is learning some ways to approach and, and to conduct a conversation 
with people in those circumstances that will help you and help them get closer to what would need to occur in order for them to make a change and to get a better understanding of what their business issues are. So I really appreciate you bringing that up, Marcia. Thank you. Al, Al Phillips, how's it going? Al, you may need to start. I'm here. How are you? Long <laughs> okay. time to talk. Welcome back. Thank you. Same to you. Um, the, the price, and we try to mitigate the price cycle costs and suggesting to the management solutions that HP and that's trying to get into a business cell a lot of pushback and a lot of objections regard to believing us actions that could be had with this and that's a very we're finding a lot of objections to people planning a a management Management is very. It's kind of a maybe their management infrastructure is need that they they should be, and if they did it, they'd save some mitigate the issue. But that's an objection we get all, all the time. People just want price, price. Don't do, do anything in terms of edit solutions that we offer ownership. We want to we are picture and then again and because I think one of the things that I heard you say is you can tell them that that if they invest in some of it will mitigate the price. But you know what particularly in responding to objections is trying so what we're going to learn is, hopefully what we will learn is, um, how you to engage the customer in a conversation with themselves or not. Me that if I, instead of one, it's going to be less expensive, or I don't care. So part of the, um, Sort of an odd. We cannot make people buy. Buy five apples just because it's a better. Price. So part of actions is is taking. You know, what is this? Perhaps this customer's account is not a good business. To One of the things we're going to consider as we move forward today, as well, Al, and let's see, Karen. Are you? Well, thank you. What would you add? Exactly. Uh, it's, it's a credibility issue. Under yes. to uh, make a business case that we will lower their. It's. It, it seems. Uh, what. Frequently feel that the PC is is a for a higher purchase price. Now let me ask you. Let me ask you this, Carrie. Lost a deal even when your price was. Yes, I have. Very often. Okay. And. Um, you know, typically it's it, it by a higher price through a, through a and and it and it I believe exists because I, uh, you know which typically revolves um, is also available with our competitor specs. Sure. Arguments that we're making seem to to the competitors, and they they're saying it is I'm not seeing any extra value. Right, 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 and it's a credibility thing, and that's that was my credibility thing. Like it hurts your credibility. No, it doesn't hurt hurt our credibility. 
equipment. Okay. It's, it's, it, 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 they are credible to them because yeah. it, if, if it's simply a map, then it all boils back to the higher price. And, okay. and, and if they don't completely TCO, and, you know, then the, the justification for the higher price is not exist. You know, with CI, we have a a, a, a better argument, and, and we can overcome it. But on a standard desktop deal, it'd be harder. It, it's going to be a lot harder. Okay, thank you very much for that. I, I that I'm hearing all of you say today. I did a little things already. So before how to respond to these objections, I think reviewing the leadership because um, what we're going to be learning are come out of remind everybody uh, previously. Actually, before we do that, though, let me review what's going to happen in next session. So um, session two is going to be um, the, this final piece around, sort of around objections, which is helping the customer make a business comparison. So we're going to learn some tactics and strategies for how to have the customer compare different solutions, not to one another, but actually to compare the solutions to their needs. We're going to also learn that closing the sale is best held as a non-event, and you'll learn more about what that is. And in fact, I do believe that when we execute the sales process from this leadership approach that it really truly is a non-event. And yet we still need to, what I call, create a space for and What that means is that you really have to interact with your customer in such a way that, that saying yes or saying no, either answer is okay. Because when a customer feels like the only acceptable response from them is, yes, I want to buy, it, they feel pressured. And that's not a good situation in closing because what, then what often happens is they throw out smoke screens that can cost, a lot, cost us a lot of time and money. We're going to learn some common things that occur on the customer. One of them is, is decision avoidance. It's another, another one is something that I call comparing apples to oranges. Um, finally, there's getting lost in the sale, which is I'm too, met too often. This is and all of a sudden the players are changing and somebody new is there or there's an acquisition and how do we deal with that? And in general, we'll learn some effective questioning to the you And this approach is, is that you're going to call leadership selling approach. And if you did not, um, if you have not taken leadership selling skills, we're going to put those couple hands down, Marcia and I know she was there. So if you've not taken leadership selling skills, Carrie, I know you did. I'm pretty sure. So just John's the only one that's not taken it yet? John, we're going to have to get you in that class. Okay. There may be a few others. All right. Thank you very much for that. So um, what stuck with you? I want to hear from you again. Here's another money-making opportunity. Wait, after that course, what are some of the, the concepts of the things that you learned that stuck with you from leadership selling skills? Tom. How are you this morning? Good, good. How about fool's gold? Absolutely. Tell me what that means. Uh, basically, a, an opportunity that's not really an opportunity. Maybe a, a company that's, you know, putting an RFP out, but they really have no intention to, to change standards. Or to Marsha's, use Marsha's words, there's no compelling reason for them, no compelling business reason for them to make a change. How has that concept helped you in your sales? Well, I think, you know, to... Uh, to more objectively look at RFPs that come out or understand where current customers are so that I can uh, direct my my selling efforts to uh, accounts that truly do have maybe a, a realistic opportunity of, of making a change. Thank you very much for that, Tom. Who else? Other things that have stuck with you? Okay, I'll tell you what. Let's move into the overview, and maybe things will start popping out in your mind and say, oh, that's right, oh, that's right. By the way, in that electronic workbook that I sent to you, that I emailed to you, for those of you that, that are interested in doing a quick review, there are, there are um, 
starting on page two of that workbook, there's a review of some of these key concepts if you wanted to spend some time looking at that later. Diana, you had your hand up. Hi, Lisa. Hi. Uh, the thing that really has stuck with me is not ans- asking questions that can be answered with a yes or no, and it's so easy to do that, and I really have, have worked hard in my sales calls to word things differently to open up for more conversation. And how, what have you noticed as a result of that? Well, you get more information. I mean, that's that's key to everything, and, and it makes it easier to kind of steer the conversation where you want it to go instead of getting cut off at the knees by asking a yes-no question that just stops everything. Oh, Diana, congratulations. That's excellent. Thank you so much for that. Paul, what would you like to add? I just wanted to say that one of the things that sticks in my mind is uh, really determining with the customer if there's pain. Um, if there's no pain, I think your efforts are pretty well wasted. And, and not only that, this is when these objections, when objections come up that seem like they're just insurmountable, in many cases, if you take a close look, what you're going to find out is that there is no business pain. There may be what we call product or process pain, which we're going to review in a moment. But you know what? If there's no business reason for me to invest in something, I can, can and will come up with objections that you simply have no answer for. There's no way you can overcome this objection because the fact of the matter is there's no business reason for me to go ahead with it anyway. So excellent. Thank you, Paul. Let's go ahead and review some of these concepts. So the concepts that we're going to actually review for leadership selling are the, the sales model, if you will, which, which was just brought up. And in that, talking about the difference and is and just recognizing again that pain drives change, that we have to uh, shift our sales approach from a product focus to a business focus. One of the reasons why is because the way that the customers are making decisions are changing. What used to be simply a technology decision is no longer a technology decision. Technology decisions have become business decisions. They're business critical. They're driven by mission and vision. They, they can make or break a career if somebody makes a good decision to, say, go with some, something like you know, CCI or not, and they make a mistake or, or something that's not going to bode well on them. And because of this, many of these decisions are influenced and ultimately owned at that executive level. Because of – now, I, I, that said, I know many of you are thinking, yeah, but not if someone's just going to replace a bunch of desktops. I'm here to tell you that if a company decides they're going to change their desktop technology, there was most likely, and it's an enterprise situation, there was most likely an executive conversation. You may not have been privy to it, but there is some business reason why they are doing that. And be, what typically happens is that somewhere probably before you got keyed into the fact that this change was going to be made, there was an executive conversation that had a very much of a business focus to it. But what happens is once they make the decision, yes, there's a good business reason for us to do this, then they hand off that decision to be executed by these lower-level people who then look at it simply as who's going to give me the cheapest price. We'll, we'll be talking more about that because that has a lot to do with what happens with our objections. So because technology, technology decisions, decisions are no longer just that, they are now business decisions, because of this, this is what's driving us to change our sales model. We need to move away from being box sellers and feature focused for, to a different perspective. And that is characterized by, first of all, a business person to business person approach. The sales model no longer applies. It, particularly executive decision makers, these are business people first. And you know, I've also noticed in my own selling experiences that this is trickling down. People that I interact with that are not at an executive level or at a you know, below, director or below level are also key to and are able to have conversations with me about the business impact of their investments. So business people want to buy from business people. So we need to be business people in our sales approach. We have to stop viewing ourselves as being salespeople and actually view ourselves as business advancers who sell value. Now, what I heard earlier was, well, yeah, that, that the problem there is we may be selling value, but that may not be what they are buying. Well, the they that we're talking to in those cases undoubtedly are going to be people whose job focus is on the process of the purchase, not on the business impact of the purchase. When we, in fact, are engaging with people 
who live close to and who personally are impacted by the success or failure of a business decision, that this is the model that we need to embrace. Successfully executing this approach, as you will recall, is primarily a function of how we think. Those leadership sales beliefs are so important, so let's review what they are. The first one is operating from abundance. There's more better than I have the capacity to fill. In fact, it is true. I mean, if there was some magic way that every account that you're working on where there was an opportunity, where there truly even was some business pain, if everybody raised their hand at one time, there's no way you could get to them all. And particularly now in this, in this emerging economy where things are getting better, money's freeing up a little bit more. The, the economic recovery has slowed down a bit, but it's, we are still in recovery. And so people are out there looking for how they can make changes in order to improve their business. When we approach opportunities as though there is more business out there than I have to fill, I am now operating from abundance. It's no longer about me trying to convince you that, there, that the TCO uh, reason for making a, a, an investment is the right one. There's no convincing there. Either you get it or you don't. It doesn't mean that I don't have the conversation, but it takes me out of convincing mode and puts me into consultative mode. What else? Well, I'm a business person that just happens to sell stuff. I'm not a salesperson. I'm not here to tell you what you need. I'm here to understand what the business reasons are that you're looking to make a change and to work with you to advance you towards that. In fact, I am a business advancer. Leadership salespeople operate from this place. The highest value wins. And you know what? The highest value is not always the lowest. Sometimes it's not. And finally, this is really important, is operating with our customers as peers because, in fact, they are. And when we truly embrace this set of beliefs, we actually become pretty picky about the prospects that we spend our time with. We're careful to invest our valuable resources. Valuable resources called my time, the time of my team, the, the, the equipment that I send out for evaluations, all the, those resources. When I truly embrace these beliefs, I'm very careful to invest my resources on those opportunities that are most likely to end in a sale. So to see how many of you remember, here is one of those fancy hands-up slides. What are the characteristics of an ideal opportunity based on leadership selling? What do we know? In other words, what are the characteristics of genuine gold versus fool's gold? Who remembers? Shall I just call on you? Was I talking too long? Oh, here they come. They're flying up now. Carrie. Hi, business pain. Hi, business pain. Absolutely. Where's my bell? Ding, ding. That's a buck for you. Al, what else? Well, the other half of that is product pain. Yes, it, it, that, that pro product pain is going to be what's going to catch our attention, but the characteristics of an ideal opportunity, of course, is that, is that the fact that that product pain is actually big enough that it's impacting their business in some way. Now, there was something other than pain. Al, do you remember what, what it was? Not just is there pain or not. Some sort of a compelling event that, that, that uh, has to take place uh, that needs a solution. Absolutely, and I'm going to put that in the pain category. The other, the other aspect of this has to do with who it is that we're talking to. In fact, in, in leadership selling skills, we learned that when we pour our resources into an opportunity that goes nowhere, what we call that is we said it's like mining for fool's gold or iron pyrite, which we've talked about. And in fact, that's usually a combination of two things. Definitely one of them is the, the situation that there's no business pain. But the other thing, other than the pain, oops, we went, you went to the end there. Scroll through to get to the, just go ahead and scroll through until we get to the, the right uh, slide. But other than being business pain, which is key, and it's interesting to me that there some other aspect is that it could be the wrong wrong prospect is either too few people or being high up enough. And in fact, here we are, perfect. So it's the wrong contact is, is, is one of the things we talked about, either being too low or not talking to enough people. We're going to talk about that more in a minute. The other aspect of fool's gold is there's no pain. And you know, I'm, I'm going to add a third one for you folks in PSG, and that is poor timing, and we haven't talked about this before, but we are going to talk about um, wrong prospect. So when you're too low, when you enter the, and this part of this has to do with the third one I just talked about, which is, which is poor timing. And 
into when HP and you at a level where you people the people that are the buying executing the talk to just those people and that is that the act this is the way I, I when I say the more distance there is between how they are impacted by the business, the more they are going to be focused. Not only that, if we keep our people, we are not finding out with the big business conversations difficult, close to impossible argument, if you will, for how in order to save money in the long run. So it's an objection that we can never overcome. Contacts. I just learned with a very large client of mine, and it was I hung up the phone. I thought, gosh darn. I was thankfully caught on did my contact base, but I their contact with the company for a long time. And it's contact and just we work so typically I got great information notice that things were like wasn't going right and so I reached that company and all of got a ton more information contact and shared this information and again wonderful fool's goal meaning our timeline that are really not going anywhere, where our contact arrow. Now, what about the kinds of pain, product pain and business pain? Let's just quickly define, remind ourselves what these are. Product pain is the stuff that's easy to see and easy to measure. It relates typically to product features. And now, we may have features, but everybody else has the same features that we have, or else we can come up with them pretty quickly, so that's not a way to sell. Product pain is pain that is typically experienced at the user manager level and then communicated up to through management to which time and place. This Is this something that simply you get that, but it is, is, it, is there a business? Thing we can just live with. Service, responsiveness. These are the sorts of things that may get your attention initially in having a conversation. You may get a call or receive an RFP from somebody that says, you know what, we're looking to make a change because the company that we're working right now, the product availability just isn't there for us. You know, these people just aren't responsive enough to our needs. Um, you know, we, we think there are some new features out there that we could be taking advantage of. While those are great reasons to begin a conversation, if you begin and end your conversation there, you will meet tons of price objections because product process pain is rarely enough to drive a business decision. So what is, a, what is business pain? Business pain is pain that executives experience often as a result of the product process pain. It's typically related to mission-critical issues such as value, competition, etc. Here's a little saying for you. No pain, no gain. It is the hard truth. To pain. What you will find is that the things we look for, they will magically happen. You've almost stumbled across. I get brought into a situation where there is high. There, up until the time that we started talking, no you know, there was a committee that, that was formed. There wasn't that was sent. In, in some cases, they they have no budget for training. The money because it's a big enough business reason. The opposite is also true. In the if the customer does not recognize whether you see it or not, by the way, if they don't recognize the business reason for them to make the change. The fact that they have a budget, the fact that there's a time frame, the fact that they say, yes, there's, some, there's, a, there's an executive who's sponsoring that, 
that all of that together will rarely drive a sale to a close. It's just not going to happen. Organizations will make a change when it begins to impact the mission critical. So one of the elements of Fool's Gold, and I, I wanted to review this with you now, is because so many of the objections that you're hearing, when we take a look, I will just wonder how many of them are due to the fact that it's a Fool's Gold opportunity. Certainly not all, but I would challenge you to take a look and see if perhaps the bigger problem is that maybe you shouldn't be spending so much time in that opportunity. Maybe that customer is not willing to see the business issue, no matter how obvious it is to you. So I said there was a third element for you now in PSG. Poor timing. I actually am working with Hewlett Packard um, in the workforce development area to develop a program around uh, this, this HP 7 steps of sale and forecasting more effectively. And so I've been doing a lot of research and doing a lot of interviews with different people in HP's organization within sales and outside of sales. And one of the things that I've been finding, and this is, it was very true in the PSG organization, is that all too often the sales people are entering into the sales process too late. Executives set the business critical goals, and then they hand off the execution to the process focused managers. And part of this is a function of the way that, that uh, HP is set up right now, where you have the CSG rep that sort of owns the account. And so you may not be brought in, if you will, or you may not be privy to a conversation until it's gotten to this point where the executives have already set the business critical goals and they've handed off the execution to these process-focused managers. And you know what? These process-focused managers, they're not directly impacted by the business results of the decision. So what happens is that their execution becomes a price and process battle with you and with everybody else. So this is another potential situation for a fool's gold. If you enter into the sales process too late, you have to be aware that if those business critical mission and vision issues that are driving this, this uh, replacement of desktops or this decision to look at doing, going to some sort of thin client technology, you've got to, you have to do whatever you can to work your way back to that process and find out what were those business critical issues that were driving this to begin with. So that said, these, these issues that are many things that we address in the Leadership Fundamentals course, I'm sure you remember that, if you are involved primarily with these kinds of deals, deals where you're in too low, where there's no business pain that you've been able to identify, and you got in there a little too late, you're going to find that the objections in the closing process is more frustrating. It just is. And I'm sorry I have no magic bullet for this other than the obvious, which is stop working these deals. Now, I know in many cases that's easier said than done. When I say stop working them, at least begin to shift your focus for new opportunities for genuine gold opportunities. Be willing to push back internally within your organization and say, ask them, hmm, why is this a good business decision for us at HP to continue to pursue this opportunity when all of these signals are saying that these people aren't ready to buy? What you may find is that you, along with your management, decide that it's, it's worth it for the relationship to stay involved in the sales process, but you can be involved in a sales process to many varying degrees. You don't have to be spending all of your time and energy on something that's really not going to go anywhere. The tactics that you're going to learn in this program are designed primarily for genuine gold opportunities, where there truly is some business reason for them to make a change. You have some access to not just one decision maker, but several at different levels, and the timing is good. Now, that said, you can still use the tactics and strategies and practice them on these other opportunities where maybe you're not even sure if it's real gold or not. And in fact, these strategies for responding to objections in many cases are going to help you if you're not sure yet or if you thought it was real gold and now you're thinking maybe it's not. This is more information and more tactics that's going to help you get better at that. So we're going to start our, our objection discussion on something that I call responding to competitive inquiries. Objections can come up at any point in the sales process, no doubt about it. For the purpose of this class, when I talk about objections, I'm going to define them as those obstacles that arise at the point of or following your solution presentation. The ones that happen ahead of time, like in those first conversations, those are what I call competitive inquiries. 
So, for example, when a customer, in one of your very first conversations, be it by phone or face-to-face, -face, right off the bat, before you can even say anything, they're asking you, you know, how does your on-site warranty compare to Dell's? Or how does HP's CCI solution compare to Sun's thin client strategy? When you're hearing those things right off the bat, those I put in a different category. I call those competitive inquiries. I call them that because we really don't know where these questions, what they mean or where they're coming from. We don't know. Are they planted in the customer's mind by the competition? Um, is it a statement of curiosity? Maybe they're just curious how this, how your solution compares to somebody else. Maybe they've been on the, the internet doing some research, and that's where. The While we don't know for sure why the customer is asking if we have an on-site warranty or not, of course, unless unless of course you're clairvoyant, in which case give me the, the lottery numbers. We actually don't know. We think we do. We, in fact, we're sure we know. Oh. I know IBM was in here, otherwise they wouldn't be asking me this or so. And what happens is when we assume we know what's behind the customer's question, and we tend to assume the worst, by the way, we end up not even answering the question that they're asking, but we end up trying to overcome an objection before we even know what their needs are. Not a very good way to handle this. And in fact, there's a very traditional response to these competitive inquiries, and Christopher, you and I were talking about this, what are what some of the, the ways that a traditional salesperson responds to these competitive inquiries that they hear early on? Well, one of the ways is that a traditional salesperson hears the inquiry as a challenge, and for that reason, there's this tendency to become very defensive. Now, that defensiveness comes across to the customer as a challenge to their question, and from there it becomes a vicious cycle or a battle, if you will. Um, if it's not defensive, there's usually a started wondering why the customer is making these inquiries and feeling the need to protect themselves. In other cases, and especially with process-focused manager-level decision, decision makers, these, er, these early inquiries are simply bait. They're saying, let's see what happens if I, throw, if I throw out this question. And if the salesperson at this moment reacts, the buyer knows that they have you on the hook. In other cases, the salesperson will respond by bashing the competition, which is rarely an effective path. Although, although it, it's tempting, isn't it, Christopher? Absolutely. Especially when we have information where we feel like, oh, well, you know, obviously that's what Dell was telling them. Well, let me tell, them, let me tell you how messed up Dell is. So I'm going to suggest that, that while this is sort of an emotional response, this defensive, being guarded, and, and taking the bait and what have you, um, you won't find it hard or are surprising to learn that the leadership selling approach is markedly different than that. We suggest that instead of becoming to these initial inquiries, that you for what it is in that moment, which is simply the fact that they have a question. Remember active as you is behind the question so that you can give really need and be supportive of them. instead of challenging them looking to make a significant decision for their company instead of overwhelming them and trying to tell them trying to answer we're going to suggest you do something what you need to do is find out what the fact is that you don't know where the question is coming from, and if it is an innocent inquiry or a voice of skepticism or, you know, if they're, they're trying to clarify an understanding, you need to know what's going on so that you can uh, uh, respond appropriately. So you have to resist the temptation to have all the right answers. Come out and ask you, how is CCI different than, than some thin client technology? You have to resist your feeling of sharing with them all the wonderful knowledge that you learned in last week's webinar. Because you know what? I don't believe in an initial conversation when somebody's asking you that question that they really want to know just the technology of what the differences are. There's got to be some business reason. In fact, I'll go farther than this. If, in fact, they truly are interested in just the difference between the technologies, chances are they're a propeller head that just loves technology. 
and they'll be willing to waste as much time as you're willing to give them just hearing about what the differences are. So instead of just giving them all this information, really what you want to do is redirect the conversation towards information gathering. Because if you think about it, if, if customers asking you, you know, how do you compare in price? And typically there are these comparison questions, right? You know, Dell has this to offer. What do you have to offer? It's too early to compare. At this point, the only thing you're comparing is feature to feature, and that is not a productive conversation. It's not productive for you, and it's actually not productive for the customer either. Okay. In fact, the only comparison that is productive is a comparison between your solution or other solutions and the customer's needs. And you cannot do that well if you don't know what the customer's needs are. So there are two steps to this strategy we're going to learn for responding to, to competitive inquiries early on. Step one is acknowledge, and step two is called redirect. So Christopher and I are going to demonstrate it, and then we're going to get you folks involved so you can practice this, and we'll break it down to a couple different steps for you. So, so I've looked at I'm what... I'm sorry, Christopher is oh. the customer, and I'm the Available, and uh, with few exceptions, everything on the market is essentially comparable. So for us, Lisa, what it all boils down to is cost. So what can you do for me on price? You know, Chris, there are certainly similarities amongst the top tier providers in terms of capability. There's no doubt. That said, certainly there are also some applications where one provider may be stronger than another. And HP is a strong competitor in every sense, financially included. Of course, also, Chris, the price tag is really meaningless if the solution doesn't meet your business needs. Let's talk a little bit more about your unique needs. And once I understand more about the business reasons behind you moving in this direction, I'll be able to do a better job in helping you compare your options against those needs. So why don't you start by telling me a little bit more about your customers. All right, so let me hear from you. What, what did you hear there that was different than what you may have done what, what do you think would happen next? Not everyone at once now. Who have I not heard from? Amy Mielek, or Amy, are you there? I am. Amy, so what are your thoughts on that approach that you just heard Chris and I? Well, I think what I heard and what I know that most of us tend to do differently is we initially then, instead of asking about their business needs, would say, okay, what are you paying for the IBM or the Dell? Right. And, and what is that configuration that? versus what is your business need? What are you trying to accomplish with this box? What are the requirements you need in a desktop or in a notebook or whatever that solution might be, rather than what's your price from the competition? Because when you, when you do respond by saying, okay, well, what are you paying now? In fact, what are you saying to the customer by engaging in that conversation? Well, I'm saying that I'm willing to play the price game with that. Yeah. Or that I believe that maybe my price is higher, but I'll work on it. So what did you hear in that between Chris and I that you feel might work? Your inquiry about what their business needs are versus what they need out of the box. And, and you'll notice what the first thing I did there, Amy, was I first acknowledged. I said, you know what, Chris, you're right. There are certainly similarities amongst the top tier providers in terms of capability and other things, too. So we, there's two steps to this process, and thank you very much. In fact, Amy, if you're willing to hang on, you already have a dollar. If you're willing to hang on and give this a shot, you can earn even more money. How about that? <laughs> because here, let's go, let, I want to take a look at your screen here. Let's suppose you get this competitive inquiry, and I'm your customer, and I say, well, do you have an on-site warranty for notebooks? Instead of just answering that question, if you were going to employ this this um, way of acknowledging and then re trying to redirect the conversation to my needs, how might you do that? So I would answer absolutely. HP has uh, service offerings for on-site warranty, but help me understand what you're looking for from uh, what's important to you with warranty. Excellent. Round of virtual applause. What can I, I wonder if the applause button works if I do it. Yay. Excellent. Very good. Let me hear from somebody else. Thank you, Amy. So, again, we're going to stay with the same competitive inquiry. I want to hear a couple other pe other people try this. Acknowledge and redirect. Acknowledge the question and then redirect the conversation with an open-ended question that moves the focus of the conversation to the bigger, greater needs. I'm happy to call on people if, you feel, if you're feeling shy. 
Diana, thank you. Um, I think what I would do is, is exactly what Amy does. I think it's important to, to acknowledge it. So you would say, yes, we do have on-site warranty support for notebooks. What sort of warranty do you currently have on your notebook products? And then, you know, have that conversation and then maybe follow up with how has that worked out for you? Excellent. Now, Diana, I want to, I want to try and, and make, have you make one other shift. Now, if somebody is asking you about on-site warranties, what could be the business reason why they're asking that? Because they're, they're having delays with getting notebooks uh, repaired currently, or they're having a very high failure rate with their notebooks. Okay, and if they're, if they're having a failure rate or there are delays, how might that be impacting their business? Oh, it can, can cause all sorts of missed uh, uh, time frames, missed deadlines, um, productivity issues. And those would be important projects. things. And those, if, in fact, those things are occurring, those would be the business reasons why they would be making a change. Now, conversely, Diana, if you, if you ask the question, so why, what's the significance for your company in having an on-site warranty for notebooks, and they person came back and said, well, Dell's going to give it to us. We want to know if you are. What, if that's the kind of response you get, what is that telling you about at least that person's perspective on this purchase? Well, it sounds like that person isn't real worried about the business part of it. They're just trying to see if they're going to get as, as much as they can get for the, for the prize. Yeah. They're and not that would the right. tell me something about what's going on with that, with that sale. Well, that's not the right person. Absolutely. Diana, thank you so thank much. You that. Al, let's hear from you. So, Al, I say to you, so, Al, thanks for coming out here to meet with me. Do you have an on-site warranty for notebooks? Well, Lisa, what I do is something a little different. I, I agree with the customer. I'd say, you know, warranty ish, uh, warranties are very, very important to the customer. And the, pe and the type of warranty that you select is really based on your operational objectives. Can we talk about those a little oh, bit? Oh, I like that. Let's talk about your op operational objectives. Excellent. Thank you, Al. John, what would you add? John, you may have to start. Uh, no, I'm good. Are you, am I back? Yes, you're back. Yeah, excellent. The only thing I guess I would add to the two points you said, kind of bringing them together and harmonizing them would be to, you know, probe on what experience they've had in the past, what the competitive offering has, and why, you know, kind of getting to the five whys here. Why is that question important to you? What is your driver for that, and, and, and what are you hoping to accomplish, just in order to better understand what they're trying to get to to see if there's an upsell opportunity there. And the, the only place where I would, I would, I'm not going to say disagree with you, because when you gave me the examples of the why questions, they're all questions I would definitely ask. I would, the first place I... I would actually avoid going down the, the what are they getting from their competitor or, or having a competitive conversation. Coming from the leadership perspective of I don't really care when I'm, when I'm in a sales situation, I'm not, gonna, I'm not prepared to or nor am I really do I want to get in a conversation with you comparing, you know, HP to Dell or HP to IBM. Not that I can't. But the, the important conversation for the customer is really how did, does each of the solutions compare to their needs? So while, while part of finding out about that might be finding out about what the competition is offering and what's working for them there or not, because that is the way that most salespeople will start the conversation, I would just avoid starting it there. And, John, I didn't hear you say that you would start it there, but when you mentioned that, it just, it just gave me an opportunity to make that point. So here's, here's a few other, you came up with, everyone here came up with some great questions, but here's a few more. Um, you know, HP is a very comprehensive service offering. What's important to you in a warranty? Other open-ended questions for redirecting. What's your experience been with warranty? Um, what do you know about HP service? How do you ask? Now, these are down if you were going to, because they are on page number six of your electronic workbook, and if you haven't printed that out yet, again, you always can. So um, there's always space. In, in fact, if you do have your workbook in front of you and you're on page six, there's also a space where you could record some example, some sample redirecting questions for this competitive inquiry. So here's another money-making situation. So in this case, the customer says, do you have a mechanism to protect notebook um, hard drive in the event that it's been dropped? So how do we acknowledge and redirect? Who have we not heard from? Let's see. Danny Hopkins. Danny, are you there? Danny, you couldn't have been checking your email, could you? <laughs> I'm throwing a virtual um, uh, eraser at Danny. How about um, Dan Crump? 
Dan Crump, are you there? I'm here. Hello. Dan, there, is this Dan or Danny? Nope. Now you, you did you mute yourself again? I'm. I know this is being recording recorded, but I do want to pause and let Dan come back on or Danny, whoever it was. Oh, you're there. I'm on the air now. Okay. Yes. Who is this? Dan Crump. Dan Crump. So Dan. If I ask you early on in, in a conversation, do you have a mechanism to protect a notebook hard drive in the event that it's dropped, how can you respond with acknowledge and redirect? Yes, we do. <laughs> so what's the launch? No, I don't know. Um, do we have a no, 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 that is dropped? Uh, so what you want to do is acknowledge that I have this question, but instead of getting into just saying, yes, we do, and it's better than, you know, whoever's, it's better than IBM's, instead, of course, you want to find out what's behind my question and what might be the business reason why I'm asking. But, like, ask them back, like, well, do you drop a lot of notebooks? You know, why, why are you asking this question? Well, you could certainly say, why do you ask? Certainly. We want to, the first acknowledging part, um, First, we would acknowledge it, and then we would want to ask a question, something like that, to find out what's behind it. Who else can give me an example? Lisa Heyman, are you there? I'm here. So, Lisa, how might you uh, employ the strategy of acknowledge and redirect to this competitive inquiry? Well, obviously, we do have, you know, service offerings that, you know, would protect you against this. I guess I would be curious as to what they're using the notebooks for if they have a challenge with people dropping them all the time. Okay, so so good. You know, yes, we we have services or we have um, different ways to protect you. I'm curious why you ask. What? How is it that you're using the notebooks? Help me understand a little bit more about the application for these, so that we can figure out the best way to make sure that you your business goes in uninterrupted. You ha it might even be something along the lines of. Um, there's, technology is constantly improving, and there are many different ways that you can protect hard drives, and that, of course, is important for different people for different reasons. Let's talk a little bit about why that would be important for you. Al. Well, one of the things uh, I, would, I would say I, I would agree that it's very important to protect a hard drive in, in the event of a, a droppage, but uh, I would use it also as an opportunity to mention that uh, not only are there ways to protect a standard notebook, but uh, were you aware that HP has a full line of ruggedized uh, products as well? Uh, can you tell me about your environment? Maybe a rugged product is more applicable. And that, that right there, Al, can get you into the conversation of let's talk about your environment. Let's talk about the business. You know, let's talk about what's driving you towards making, looking, make, looking at making a change. And now remember, although this isn't the purpose of this course, I'm going, to, I'm going to bring your minds back for a moment to leadership selling. When they say, well, yeah, you know, we have, these are, these are used by salespeople out in the field and they're traveling and they drop them a lot. We don't just stop there and go, okay, good, I've got a hot one. Because what we've done there is we've identified what the product or process issue is, that these notebooks are traveling a lot and that people drop them. What is the question for extra credit What's the question we would ask to find out what the business impact of that, of that is? Two bucks. Jim. Well, the, the next thing I would do there is try to understand how the salesperson's sales cycle affects the productivity whether they're enter, entering orders or claims or try to, to bring it to a, a business issue that that notebook solves in the field. And then once you do that, you, you, you've got them talking uh, about the business issues and impact to the company. Excellent. Thank you. Marsha, what would you add? Um, ask them what kind of money or loss of revenue they're going to have when their notebooks are out of productivity. Yeah. And, you know, I would even say, you know, Having those notebooks out of productivity, I would imagine, impacts your business in many different ways. You might even just get big and say, what are those? I mean, some of them are probably financial, and some of them may be productivity issues. What can you tell me about that? And then you need to listen. So that was, that was by the way, two bucks for you, Jim, because you're the first one to raise your hand, and another dollar for you, Marcia. Um, you have to, we have to ask those questions and just listen. And I say just listen. Remember, leadership is not about trying to convince people that they're in pain. Any of you that have tried to talk, talk somebody in to something when they're not willing to see it, forget it. I mean, the, the saddest example 
is, is if you happen to have the unfortunate circumstance of having somebody in your life that has a substance abuse problem or something, you can sit there and see that they're killing themselves. But the one thing we know is, is true about people in those circumstances is unless they are willing to recognize their own pain, they will not take any action to make a change. So we, when we're asking these questions, we're asking questions like, what's the impact of that? To listen for, what is, the, what is this person's ability to recognize what the business issue are? How willing are they to talk about it? The more open to talking about it they are, the more likely there is that there's a bi- bigger business issue. And in the long run, when it comes to responding to objections, you can come back to that business issue and say, okay, you're, uh, now you're talking about... Um, wanting to a cheaper price on the warranty. Let's go back to the conversation we had a week ago when you shared with me the circumstances going on with your salespeople and dropping the notebooks. I'm curious what's changed about that business impact. And in that case, you're not telling them, you're asking them questions, which we're going to be getting to a little bit later. So the strategy for responding to these competitive inquiries, and I do that on purpose, don't think of them as objections right off the bat. When you're in an initial conversation and a customer asks these questions, you know, notice if you feel yourself getting defensive and just say, wait a minute, I have no idea where this question is coming from. This person, I need to be supportive of this person who's trying to make the best decision for their company. So I'm simply going to acknowledge it and then redirect the conversation. So that's a, a competitive inquiry. But what about those objections that we hear when we're farther into the sales process? What I'd like you to do is take a moment to write down on a clean sheet of paper three objections that you hear from your customers. Now, I want you to write them out down in a very specific way. I don't want you to just write down price or, um, un- or delivery. I want you to actually write the, the objection down as the customer would say it in their words. So you may have to write down a sentence or two. So instead of say, just writing down price, you might write down something like, um, you know, I need you to be more aggressive with your pricing on the notebook. So I'm actually going to be quiet in a moment of being completely unusual and write down three objections in the words of your customer. Let me hear from you now. What are some of the objections that you're likely to hear? I'm going to write these down so I can use them as examples so that we have this information be as relevant to you as possible. Dan Crump. This is literally from one of my customers at Continental. I'm telling him about CCI, and he says, Dan, have you noticed we're an airline? We don't have any money. Oh, that's a good one. Well, you just write okay. that down. But in case you get some, oh, no. But if we used it to, to dive into the, the ROI aspect of why CCI would be a good solution for them, and, it, you know, and at the end of the conversation it looked like something they might look into on down the road. Okay, well, excellent. But that, that's, that's exactly what I'm looking for in terms of examples, and I need a few more. Um, let's see, Danny. Are you there? Yes. Okay. Um, one that comes up quite frequently, I actually have two written down here so far. The first one is, what is HP doing to prevent product shortages in the future? And I'm writing it down, so hold on a second. Doing, what is HP doing to protect? To prevent. Prevent product shortages? Right. In the future. Okay, what's the other one you have? The other one is, why are your prices increasing on standard product transitions? Prices increasing on standard on standard what? I'm sorry. Product transitions. Product transitions. Okay, thank you. I'm not going to address any of these now. I'm just trying to get some examples so I can um, use them for you. Tom Bray. Um, I heard from a customer just yesterday. I'm concerned about HP's uh, recent earnings announcement. While HP stock drops and continues to indicate softness in the market. 
Dell, on the other hand, stock continues to rise, and they indicate actually they don't do not see the same softness in the market as HP does. Okay. I mean, are we going to try and just um, make this a little bit shorter? So I'm concerned about that. I'm concerned about HP's earnings. The fact that the stop the stock dropped um, while Dell's is is rising, and um, Dell isn't. Different That's views. Different views currently on the marketplace. Okay. Dell's view is that the market is not soft. Yes. Okay. These are great examples, guys. Who else? Dan, did you did you have another one you wanted to add, Dan Crum? Yeah, I've got another one that uh, I I got recently. Uh, I had a customer that we had a large RFP in with, and we knew it was a bit of a long shot, but they said, uh, you know, kind of on the record and off the record. Basically, their number one reason for not switching uh, from who they were currently on, Dell, to, to HP, was the cost of change was just too great. And, you know, that opens up a lot of avenues to have a discussion, but, you know, after the fact, uh, you know, after an RFP has already been decided on it, it's a little tough to... You're right. You know, Wouldn't it have been nice to know that up front? Okay. These are excellent examples. I'm Diana. This is one that just came up uh, recently. It's very specific, but I, I would be interested to see how we would handle this. Okay. Compare it to what I did or what I'm doing. Uh, I was meeting with a, a, a customer that I'm trying to get the business away from Dell, and they had done business with us in the past, and he said, you know, we lease everything that we buy, and we had extremely bad experiences with HP leasing, and it just makes it much easier to do It's much easier to do business with Dell. Great. Now, not great that you had that, but that's a good yeah. example. We had a bad experience with HP, easier to do business with Dell, no, easier to do business with Dell. Okay. And, you know, we can we can take more of these as time goes on, but I wanted to make sure I had some said some things that were really be- relevant to all of you. Oh, John, did you want to add one more before we move on? I hear you, John. Oop, you were there. Sorry about that. I, that's okay. Uh, one of the things I run into, I think a lot of us do, is, you know, hey, why can't I buy these products from you as an individual? Why can't I have one person who I can call with an HP? Because, you know, having 25 different people involved in the sale process just slows down my company's productivity. Why can't I have a single contact? Yeah, who can fulfill all the requirements for the customer. Okay. And that's pretty much how they say it. Okay. Single contact. Of 25. Okay. All right, so I want all of you right now to, I know others of you have been writing these down hopefully as well, or writing the objections that you, that you experience. I want you to think for a moment about what happens when you hear these objections. And I know for many of you, you hear them over and over again. So mentally get yourself in that space where there you are, you've worked hard up until this point, you know, you've, you've been up late at night, responding to RFPs, getting information, you know, here you are, you're presenting your solution, and now here come the objections. Think about what happens when you hear those objections. Picture the customer standing in front of you, handing you objection after objection. For example, you know, Dell could deploy a solution faster than HP. Not only that, I'm not sure I have a lot of confidence in your direct capability. Furthermore, we've had better experience with IBM than with HP when I really think about it over the years. And, you know, I know you've really worked hard, and I know you've been up all night, and I know that I've asked you to fly me and all of my uh, brethren all over the world to look at all this stuff. But the fact of the matter is that we're really looking for a more cost-effective solution. Those hands there holding the bricks, those are your hands. Typically, the salesperson takes and bears the weight of these objections. I've been there myself, folks. I know how it happens. Have you noticed that it seems that the supply of the bricks, or the objections, if you will, from the customer is endless? Oh, and by the way, since you're the one standing there holding the weight of these objections, they're freed up to just keep piling on more and more. Oh, and by the way, as long as you're willing to take the objections, they are willing to hand them over and pile them up on you. Well, why is this such a problem? It's a problem because the person that's bearing the weight of the objection for the answer. If you take the responsibility for solving the customer's problem, they 
expect you to resolve. And have you ever noticed that when it's on, they are there is seemingly for them? You say, okay, out for you, man. You have an issue. Get Carly to write you to know if they're not there on time and look at the that we've done and blah. So, okay, if you, you've got that. Hand you another one. Or no matter what, good enough. Person to do. Oopsie, I, I, I forgot to move, move forward. on these slides, keep going. <laughs> Here's the really important point. You've got to keep the responsibility for the objection where it belongs, which is with the objector. The customer is the one that gets to make the buying decision. The customer is the one who's spending the money. The customer is the one who objects. Therefore, resolving the objection is not your problem. It's their problem. Now, I know this is against what many of you have learned or possibly what you even believe. So before you completely shun this perspective, there's a good reason for the strategy. When you force the customer to hold the responsibility for the objection, one of two things are going to happen. What are they, Christopher? As a result, the customer will actively participate in relieving the burdens because they're motivated to come to a solution or stall the process and avoid the issue, revealing that the opportunity is actually fool's gold, which actually is good news. Anytime we can uncover fool's gold, we cut our losses. The sooner we realize an opportunity is fool's gold, the more freedom we have to redirect our resources. Now, I know it can be hard to let go of a deal that you put your time and effort into, but the alternative is worse. And that alternative is keeping a deal in the funnel, month after month, quarter after quarter, until the customer finally pulls the plug. So re remember, if you, one of the tactics we learned in, in leadership selling skills was to just say no or respectively decline from continuing to participate in what looks like a fool's gold opportunity, if you respectively decline from what looks like a fool's gold opportunity, and in fact you're wrong, the customer is going to let you know. What I mean by that is if you keep the responsibility for the objection where it lies, which is with the customer, and I'm going to show you how to do that tactfully, if you keep the responsibility there and you say, no, 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 you have an issue about delivery, you hold on to that brick. You hold that responsibility, and now let's talk about what's in it for you for finding a resolution and why it would be important for you to do that. If you keep them responsible for that objection and they keep on trying to hand the brick to you, then what you know is that there probably is not a good business reason behind their decision. And, in fact, the deal is going nowhere. And the best salespeople with the Biggest ovaries are the ones that are willing to say, you know what, I don't care that it's been six months of my time that's in here. I'm not saying you say this to the customer. But internally you say, you know what, I, I did it again, but fair enough, I'm relieving myself of this. I'm not going to respond anymore. You know, if you've got an issue with that, sounds like you've got an issue with it. If you can come up with something, let me know. If not, we're done. If you basically take yourself out of the mix, but they really want to do business with you, are they going to let you go? Of course not. Of course not. If they really want to work with HP, they're going to be motivated to try and come up with a solution. Now, there's another element here, which is this. The, the closer the customer or the prospect that you're talking to, the closer the business issue, I mean the higher up they are in the organization, First of all, here's a surprise for you. The fewer objections you're going to have, the pleasure of working with executives, you don't hear things like, you know, uh, every 15th laptop for free. That's not what their focus on is on. You do hear, which may be things more, Maybe big picture things about I'm a little bit concerned regarding HP's financial positioning. And maybe that's something you hear more from an executive. Or, um, you know, we we understand the we understand the business reason for going with a consolidated uh, infrastructure, but we're 
we're not certain that HP is the direction we want to go in, you know, we, and we're trying to figure that out, the person, the executives are going to be more likely to participate in resolving the issue. So this, is a, this again, will be a clue to you. If somebody's title on their business card says director, but they don't want to participate in the, uh, in the resol resolving of the issue, then either there's no pain or that person is not really, I'm not, not they're not who they say they are, but they are not the ultimate decision maker. Also, the father of the prospect business issue, the more and the less likely the prospect will be to participate in the resolution. So the opposite, in fact, is true then. The closer they are to the business issue, the fewer objections you're going to hear, the more likely they're going to be to want to participate. The farther they are from the business issue, the more objections you're going to hear and the less likely the prospect is going to be to participate in the resolution. It's just more information for you as you're going down the path to go, hmm, maybe I shouldn't have been spending so much time here or maybe I need to go talk to somebody else. This is just another reason to go in high and get in early, which are some of the tactics we've been talking about before. All right, so this said, Lisa, I buy it. I, I, I believe you. I want to keep the responsibility of the objection where it belongs. I want them to, to get involved in the resolution, but how do I do this? Well, we've got the answer. We've developed a four-step process for responding to really any objection. Now, notice I didn't say overcome any objection. Please keep this in mind. It is not your responsibility to overcome an objection. And furthermore, you know you really can't. And the harder you try, the more the customer is going to resist. Instead, relieve yourself from that responsibility and instead take on the role of the facilitator. You can use these four steps that you see here on the screen. Acknowledge, isolate, clarify, and resolve. Use these steps to facilitate the customer to resolve their own issue. What we're going to do here for the remainder of our time is that we're going to learn this process by breaking down each step. Now, you can use each of these steps independently. Sometimes you'll use them all together. As we're learning them, as with any skill, if you, if, when breaking them down into steps, sometimes it will feel a little bit odd or uncomfortable. Any of you that have learned how to juggle, I, I took this class one time. I think I was on a cruise or something. And I thought, I'll take this class on how to juggle. And I thought it was really odd, some of the things that they had us do. I'm thinking, what does this have to do with juggling? But then when the whole process came together, it made more sense. So hang in there if it seems like it doesn't make sense, because I believe it will in the end. Step one is what we is acknowledge. Basically, customers, lower level customers, the ones that are more focused on the process and execution, that are more focused on price, they're expecting you to argue with them. They're expecting that when they come to you and say, um, you know, I really – I really don't think that the total cost of ownership, I think it's nothing more than just a way for you to charge us more money. When they something, say something like that, they're basically looking for you to argue with them. So you know what? Surprise them and don't. In fact, do the opposite. Disarm the prospect by not questioning and not arguing. Also, from a mental perspective, look at the objection as information. It's what it is. Don't to talk them out of it or tell them that. Instead, very simply repeat the objection back to the prospect. You have to do it sincerely. And you can't do it with a question in your voice, but simply repeat it back to them as a way to validate and cause them to clarify further what that objection might be. So Chris and I are going to um, demonstrate this first step and then give you a chance. First, we're actually going to demonstrate what not to do and then we'll demonstrate what to do. In this case, Christopher is going to be the customer. I'm going to be the salesperson. For the purpose of each of these demonstrations, we're going to be taking the same objection and working it through all of the steps. However, in between, we'll be using some of these objections that you folks just gave me to practice each of the steps. So Christopher is going to start as the customer. So Lisa, we need to get this done quickly. And to be honest, I'm not sure that HP can respond as fast as, say, Dell can. So deployment's the deciding factor for you. Okay, that was what not to do. What's the problem with how I responded to Chris? He said we need to get this done quickly, and I'm something like I'm not sure that HP can respond as fast as Just now. a yes-no answer. 
When I asked him, so, so deployment's the deciding factor for you. It's a yes or no answer. What else? Responded in the form of a question. What was that? Responded in the form of a question. So, and, and what's the problem with that? Well, you should basically just repeat the objection and allow them to expound on it a little more. Yeah, just repeat it and let them expound on it. When Amy, what were you going to say? I was just going to say that you didn't acknowledge his objection. Right. My, in fact, my question, right back, my question back to him was, so deployment is the deciding factor. Right. Is that what Christopher said? No. No. And here's what, what typically will happen. Actually, Lisa, did you want to add something? I was just going to make the comment that you made some assumptions about what their decision criteria were. And, in fact, it's possible that Chris would now say what? Yes. Right. Right? And now I'm going to walk away going, okay, it's all about deployment. Right, and that may not have anything to do with it. Absolutely, Lisa, that's $2. My point here is this, folks. I wonder how often you, I wonder how often I, I wonder how often Christopher walks out of a conversation creating an objection that actually wasn't there or spending a lot of time overcoming an objection that I never would have had to do if I hadn't planted it in the person's mind or restated it but, however, through the restating of it, created a new objection. So that's what not to do. Now we're going to show you what to do. So, Lisa, we need to get this done pretty quickly, and I'm not sure that HP can respond as fast as, say, Dell can. You need to get this done really quickly, and you want to be certain that HP can respond fast. Yeah, we need to move while we have the budget and the executive support that we have now. It's all about striking when the iron's hot. So what happened that time, folks? What's what's going on with Chris, do you think? You can raise your hand. Oh, I'll call on you. Mike Cummins, are you there? I am. How's it going, Mike? Not too bad. So what happened there in that little interaction, that last interaction between Chris and I? You were able to find out additional information other than what was offered on the front end. And did I ask him another question? No, I simply, no. I simply acknowledged it. I said, okay, so... You need to get this done quickly, and you want to be certain that HP can respond fast. I didn't change the meaning of what he said. I used slightly different words, but I didn't question it. I didn't say to him, oh, well, so, you know, so obviously you haven't heard that we've changed all the ways that we respond and how we do it really quickly. I didn't challenge him. I just simply acknowledged it. Thank you very much for that, Mike, and I'm happy to see you here. I missed your name up there before. Believe it or not, folks, this step can be one of the hardest ones because it feels funny when you first practice it. There's a, a little, little voice in our salesperson mind that says, when the customer gives us an objection, we need to have an answer. And in fact, what I'm here to tell you is that if you answer too quickly, it's, the customer is going to assume that you didn't hear them, and it's going to become a big fight. So the, uh, the other tactic that's very typical, other than answering the objection, is coming back right away with clarifying it. So. You know, another typical way is when Chris says, you know, we have to do this done and fast, we have to get it done quickly, and I'm not sure that HP can do that as well as Dell can. You know, the typical thing with a salesperson would be to ask him questions like, well, how fast do you need it, or why do you think we can't respond, or what makes you think that Dell can do it faster? None of those responses are going to be effective because all of those responses, anytime you respond to a customer's objection with a question, when the first thing out of your mind is a question, you run the risk of the customer hearing your question as a challenge to their objection and that they are going to feel committed about making being right that their objection is really an objection. So it's really much more effective to simply acknowledge it. So here's what we're going to do now. I'm going to call on some of you. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to demonstrate a few more. Now, I have written down the objections that you came up with earlier, but you can use other ones. So I want you to raise your hand and give me a customer objection. You just say it exactly like the customer, and I'm simply going to feed it back to you in an acknowledging tone of voice. So I'm going to do that a couple of times, and then I'm going to give you a chance to do it. So who wants to go first? Who has an objection they want to feed to me? I know you haven't written down. This is overwhelming, this opportunity to get this great help. Hello. Don. Can you hear me? Don. Okay. You're the customer. I'm the salesperson. Give me the objection. Um, I'd like global deployment at one U.S. based uh, sales cycle. So you're looking for global deployment in one U.S. based sales cycle? Yes. Okay, now, 
Let me show you what not to do. Say that again. Give me the, the, the objection again. Uh, I'm looking for global deployment with one U.S. sales contact. And why is it that you want to do that? Our headquarters is here in Chicago, and we handle all global standards and deployments, and we want to be able to control the, the, the remote deployment of the solution. Okay, so now that I've asked them that question, we may have gotten a little more information, but if there's any emotion behind that, you know, he's, now he's giving me this information about because we want to do it in this way, and if I can't fulfill that need, my tendency is going to be to come back and say, well, do you realize that that might not be the best way to do it? So you really don't want to ask the question back. You first simply want to acknowledge it in order to get more information. Okay, so John, let me give you an objection. I'm going to give you a different one, and I want you to practice just acknowledging it back to me. You ready? Yes. Okay. Um, you know, John, we've looked at this, and while certainly there are some reasons to move ahead, it looks like the cost of change is just too great. <laughs> um, see, my natural instinct would be to say that to start to probe into what are your costs of changes and where, you know, where are you experiencing yeah, you don't want to do that yet. Um, see, you know, now watch what happens. If you start asking me what are my costs of change, what I'm hearing is, okay, he doesn't believe me, and I. And do you think I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a big, huge list? But it's not just me about about me having the list. The customer, it puts the customer in a situation where they feel like they have to justify their issue. So let me say it again and practice feeding. You can give it another shot. Okay. Okay. So we've looked at this a lot, and while it certainly seems like there are some reasons to go ahead with it, the cost of change is just too great. Oh, man. So I just want to get back to you saying uh, I understand. You know, I understand the cost of change can be very difficult. That would, something like that would be fine. Who else wants to give that one a shot? And I know it feels weird, John, but hang in there because it's so effective. Okay. Somebody else. Al. So Al, I'm going to say it to you again, and you feed it back to me. Same objection. You know, Al. While there certainly is some reasons to go ahead with this, I'm just, you know, the cost of change is just too great. Can you hear me, Lisa? Yeah, I can now. Okay. Um, well, I understand cost of change certainly uh, is an issue, but you did say there were other reasons to go ahead. Could we talk about those other reasons first, and then uh, let's step back to the uh, cost of change issue? No, you're getting – we are going to actually get to that step, but that step is a little later. This is the reason why, Al. You want um, – so you acknowledge the first, the first part, which you said, I understand the cost of to change – cost of change is too great, but you also said there are some reasons to go ahead. It feels almost like you're, you're ignoring the cost of change is too great. And in fact, yeah, I am. <laughs> well, but see, you don't need to and you don't want to. Okay. We simply want to acknowledge it and then let me give you more information. Notice what happens when you simply feed it back to me, and, I'll, and I'm going to respond. So let's try it one more time, Al. Okay. So, Al, there certainly are some reasons to go ahead with this, but in the, in the, in the long run, we just think that the cost of change is going to be too great. Well, you know, cost of change is, is a definite uh, issue uh, for any customer. Um, no, that's it. Just stop right don't there. Don't just leave it. Okay. Yep. Just oh. leave it. See, here's the thing. You don't have to don't follow it up with a question. You're just going to acknowledge it. Got it. Okay, because when you say that, and I would probably acknowledge both pieces of it. So I'd say, so certainly, I, I, while you certainly see some reason to go ahead with this, the cost of change is, too, is just too great for you at this point. Then the customer would say, we're probably going to come back and say, yeah, you know, we really appreciate what you've done or we've looked at this or we think maybe down the line. But what you're doing is the message you're sending to them is, I'm not here to argue with you. I'm listening to what it is you have to say. And they're, it's, it's a mental setup that's going to get them to be able to get to the next step. Now, there's a couple of other interesting things that will happen sometimes with acknowledge the objection. Sometimes when the customer hears their own objection back, it will A, go away, or B, change. So you, the customer may say, while there's some reasons to go ahead with this, the cost of change is really too great. The salesperson says, so you see some reasons to go ahead, but at this point you feel the cost of great, the change is too great. And they'll say, well, it's probably not so much the cost of change as it is the fact that what we really want to do is make an investment in upgrading, and we can't do that yet. Now, that's a whole other story, isn't it, folks? And think about if you would have spent all this time showing them how the cost of change isn't really so great or blah, blah, blah. And sometimes the objection will, and you'll be surprised how often people, you'll, you'll be the objection back and they'll say, you know what, 
that I can figure that out. That really isn't actually that big of an issue. Let's go ahead, or go ahead to the next step at least. Okay, let's hear from somebody else. Give me an objection, and, I, and let's practice acknowledging. I'm going to call on some folks. Who have I not heard from? Hold on a second. Tom Bray, how are you, Tom? Doing well. Tom, do you want to give me an objection and have me acknowledge one, or do you want me to give one to you and have you acknowledge it? I'll be the customer. Okay. I'm concerned that HP's recent uh, financials with the stock dropping fairly considerably. Do you have some concerns about the recent stock situation with HP? Yes. Okay. Now, now that I'm not, of course, so you know, I'm not just going to leave it there. We are going to go on to step two. But what happens when I simply acknowledged it? How did that feel for you? It, it kind of just sets you back a little bit. As if I was in the customer spot, you know, not that I'm waiting for an answer, but it kind of, I guess, halts halts some of the conversation. Well, now you'll notice, and you'll notice with step number two that we're gonna we're gonna keep on continuing this. But the difference is this. Say say that to me again about the fact that you're concerned about HP's. Um, I'm concerned about HP's recent uh, financial announcements and the stock dropping considerably. You know, I I know that you must be, and I think a lot of people are, and I think it's really unfortunate. You know, a lot of people, um, while yes, the stock has dropped. If you look at what the analysts are saying. There was actually a 9% increase in terms of our earnings over next year, and this is better and that's better and the other thing's better, so you realize you're really being stupid and thinking this. Now, of course, we don't say that last part. Yeah. But isn't that what, we, what many of us would do? Well, let me show you why you're wrong. Yep. And by simply just pausing and saying, so you've got some concerns about that. What I'm saying is, that's okay. I can understand that. All right, so that's acknowledged. You've got to practice this, folks. If we were in a live face-to-face -face situation, we'd be doing some, uh, you have an opportunity to do a few different exercises. I'm going to recommend that you grab somebody that's been in this class, do it over the telephone, I don't care where, but you come up with a list of objections and you just practice acknowledging them back and forth and back and forth, and you do that with each of these steps. Let's go on to the next step. So if that's acknowledged, the next step is, yes, is isolate. What do I mean by isolate? Well. You don't want to waste your time and energy on smoke screens, or you don't want to waste time and energy, like the example I gave you, when we fed back the issue around you know, the cost of change is too great, and they said, well, actually, it's not really that, it's something else. You know, let's not, let's not waste our time on things that aren't whatever the real issue is. So what you want to do is try to isolate the true or the most pressing objection. Whatever the true objection is, the other ones, the other sort of phony baloney stuff will end up really sort of going away. And there's questions that we use to do this. And of course, assume we've acknowledged and they've responded. And then we actually want, now it's time to ask some questions, questions that will help us to isolate whether or not this is truly the real objection or not. Christopher, what are some of the questions we can ask? Sorry, guys. Okay. I asked Chris for a question, and I, he had his phone muted. So, Chris, what are some of the questions that you could ask to isolate it? Uh, well, you could ask, um, if that wasn't an issue, what would your thoughts be on going ahead with this? Or you could ask, other than that, how closely does our recommendation fulfill your needs? Or you can ask, that is obviously an important issue in the decision. Let's set that aside for a moment and come back to it. What aspects of the solution do you feel good about? So now what Chris and I are going to do is we're going to show you how these questions work in the process. So we're going to take that same objection we were working with before. He's going to give me the objection. I'm going to acknowledge it, and then I'm going to isolate it, and we'll notice what his response is and see what happens from there. So we need to get this done quickly, and I'm not sure that HP can respond as fast as, say, Dell can. You need to get this done quickly, and you want to be certain HP can respond fast. Right. We need to move while we have the budget and the executive support that we have now. It's all about striking when the iron's hot. Chris, let's assume for a moment that you knew or you had some evidence that, that HP could respond as quickly as you needed. Based on the conversations that we've had, how well do you think these recommendations meet your total business needs? Okay, so now let's pause for a moment. What are we doing here? Well, we're doing two different things. When I ask Chris, Let's assume for a moment that, you, that HP or you had some knowledge that HP could respond quickly. What I'm saying to him is, you know, or some of the other sample questions, is that back, Chris, go back one slide. And let's look at some of those other sample questions you had. You know, if that wasn't an issue, what would your 
than that, Chris, how closely do you feel our recommendations fulfill your needs? Well, Christopher, that's obviously an important issue in the decision. Let's set that aside for a moment. We will come back to it. What aspect of your solution do you feel good about? When we ask these kinds of questions, what kind of response could we get from Chris? I mean, there's obviously many different ones. What are some of the different kinds of responses we could get from the customer? Who have I not heard from lately? Mark Ellard, are you there? Yes. I remember you from a past training. Mark, how are you doing? Good. So what do you think, how might Christopher respond to these kinds of isolation questions? Did I lose you? Do you want me to give you a recap? Yeah, yeah, give me a recap. Okay. So what happened was Christopher started off by saying, you know, we really need to get this done quickly. I'm not sure if HP can do it as fast as Dell. I acknowledge that. So, okay, so you have to do this quickly. He said, yeah, you know, we've got to do it while, the, while, the, while we have to strike, while the iron's hot. We have to do it we've got, while we've got the budget. And I said to him, okay, so let's assume for a moment that you knew that we could. Or, or You know, obviously that's an important part of your decision. Let's set that aside for a moment. What aspects of the solution that we've presented to you do you feel good about? What happens then? When he, what kind of answer would he possibly give me? Well, I guess it would depend on his, his, his true interest level. He's either going to blow you off or, or confide in you more. Okay, and if he confides in me, in me more, what might that sound like? When you say he might confide in me more, I'm assuming you mean he would you know, perhaps say, well, I, I like this about what you presented, I like that right. about he, what you presented, He would, et, he would et share more detail about about what he's looking at and, and, like you just said, what he liked about your, your, your presentation or your offer. And as he's doing that, and this is something for you to be thinking about, when you ask the customer, okay, other than this issue that isn't right, and I understand we need to talk about that, but other than that, what do you see that does work? What you're helping them do is put their issue in perspective. Because what happens too often for all of us when we're making a decision whether it's buying a house or going to dinner or whatever it is, sometimes the minute an objection comes up, we get too focused on that objection, and whatever we focus on will expand. And I know you've all probably been in a situation yourself where you've gotten yourself all caught up in focusing so much on, on this objection, and then somebody will innocently come in and say, well, wait a second, let's get this into perspective here. You know, you've got this one issue, but look at all this good stuff. Is this really, you know, do you really want to let this be a showstopper or not? So one of the things we're trying to do by isolate is help the customer to put this in perspective. The other thing we're doing by isolating the objection is finding out, is there something else? Because if I say to Christopher, other than that, how does our recommendation fulfill your needs? And he says, well, gee, not really very well. I want to know that. That's when he may throw out four or five other objections, in which case I have to find out, okay, well, which of those is most important and why? Once again, this is a really important step that's going to save you so much time. So now I want to give you a chance to practice this. We're actually going to leave these um, questions up here so you have them to practice with. What I want you to do is raise your hand, and um, I'm going to give you an objection, and I want you to practice acknowledging and then isolating. And those of you that are willing to, to jump in and try this, I know it's somewhat of a, of, uh, a risk because we're here in front of our peers and I'm telling you, you are going to get so much out of this. So who would like to go next? All righty. How about Carrie? You've been a good sport. Carrie, are you there? I'm here. So Carrie, I'm, um, why don't you give me an objection first? I'll do it. I'll demonstrate, acknowledge, and isolate, and I'll give you a try. Um, let's see. I can give you some. I have some written down. If you uh, I think I got one. Um, it's kind of like the other one. Uh, you know, our experience with Dell has been so positive, cause, and we just don't think you can match them in terms of com con efficiency and consistent low price. You've had a really good experience with Dell, and you're wondering if we'd actually be able to to match them on experience and price and things like that. Yeah. So let's set that aside for a moment. I certainly appreciate the fact that you have a relationship with Dell and, and it's good that you have a relationship with somebody that you feel you can rely on. Based on the, the needs that we've discussed previously and what it is you're looking to accomplish, what is it about the recommendations that we've made that you feel could help you move more swiftly towards your goals? Well, you do make good products. and. And, uh, and we've always had a good, positive experience with HP. Okay, so now, and again, folks, so you know, we're not done. 
we are we do have to go back and address this issue of him not being sure, certain that we can do as much for him as Dell can. But at least we've gotten him to okay. So now there's a little bit more perspective here. Now I'm actually going to isolate it in in another way. So give me the objection one more time. I'll show you another isolation. Then I'll give you um, a chance at this, Carrie. Okay. Um, I'm just not sure that that HP can uh, can match Dell in terms of efficiency and and uh, consistent low price. You're not sure we can match Dell in efficiency and um, consistent low price. Correct. If that wasn't an issue, what would your thoughts be on going ahead with us? It, it would be, it would be positive. How so? Then I might ask him that question. But I'm getting into step three, which is clarify. Okay. Now your turn. Right. Do you want me to give you that um, objection, Carrie? Or do you want me to give you a different one? Oh, you can, whatever you want. Another one's fine. Okay. I'll give you a different one. You're going to acknowledge and then isolate. Just, you, you just use those isolation questions right off the screen. Um, let's see. Um, Carrie, I, you know, I'm concerned about the recent product storages. Um, Pardon me, product shortages that HP has had, and um, I'm just wondering what they're doing to prevent that in the future. So you're concerned about not having product when you need it and what we're doing to prevent that? Yes, I, I am concerned about that. Very well done. Nice acknowledgement. Okay. Um, what am I supposed to do now? No, I'm sorry. I to isolate. I, I just got so excited about your acknowledgement, I had to acknowledge it. <laughs> So I'll, I'll give you my, my response to your acknowledgement, and then you want to try one of these sample isolation questions. Okay. Um, yeah, you know, we've, um, we haven't experienced that ourselves so much, but the company where I was previously, that was an issue. Sure, and, and I understand what you're saying. If that, if that was an issue, it wasn't an issue, if, if we could uh, provide sufficient assurances, what would be your thoughts on going ahead with this? Very nicely done. Yay. Okay, so now what he's doing is, it, and I, depending on the response that I gave him, I might say, well, um, my, thoughts, uh, my thoughts on going ahead would be good, or I might say, well, you know, uh, you'd have to have a really good price, mm -hmm. which, again, is just giving me information. Remember, the purpose of, the, of these steps of acknowledge, isolate, clarify, and respond, it's not about talking them out of the objection. This is not overcoming objections because you cannot – overcome somebody else's objection. I've tried it with my one-and-a-half and a two-and-a-half-year-old. Two I've tried it with my 65-year-old customers. It doesn't work with anybody. Okay, one more person who wants to give it a try. Terry, would you like to say a word about how valuable that was for you to have that opportunity? Get somebody else in here who wants to give this a shot. Go for it. Who wants to give it a shot? Okay. We're going to move on because we're getting a little bit short on time, but you do need to practice this. Okay, so that's isolate. Let's go ahead a couple slides here. I've got to find where I am. Um, all right, so we did that demonstration, so that was isolate. Okay, keep going. All right, so now that we've isolated it, presumably at this point, we know that we have what the real objection is. Now we need to go back and ask some questions to understand more about where it's coming from. Don't assume that you know what it means. So now... Um, some of the objections we heard were, were things around, um, uh, I'm, I'm concerned about, the, about what's going on with your stock price, or I'm, not, I'm concerned that you can't give me as good a pricing or be as consistent in delivery as Dell. We still don't know exactly what those things mean. So we need to ask open-ended questions to clarify, to ensure that we understand and we're, that we're on the same page with the prospect. And also, sometimes by asking a few questions, once again, and I are going to now add on clarification. Actually, what's going to happen this time is that, so you have to pay attention here, folks, because I'm going to be calling on you at the end of this. So now you want to listen. Christopher is going to give me the, the objection, the same one. I'm going to demonstrate, acknowledge, and isolate. And then I'm going to ask you to jump in with what some open-ended clarification questions could be based on Christopher's response. So go ahead, Chris. So we need to get this done quickly, and I'm not sure that HP can respond as fast as, say, Dell can. You need to get this done really quickly, and you want to be certain that HP can respond fast. Right. We need to move while we have the budget and the executive support that we have right now. See, it's all about striking when the iron's hot. Christopher, let's assume for a moment that you have some evidence that HP truly could respond as quickly as you need us to. Based on our conversations, how well do you think these recommendations meet your total business needs? Well, you've done a great job in addressing our needs from a solutions perspective, 
and uh, appreciate the time you spent understanding our business needs, not just our computing needs. Uh, I just need to be certain that you can deliver on the solution in our time frame. Okay, folks, it's your turn. Now, that's what Christopher just said. What are some open-ended questions that we could ask to uh, get him to talk more about this? Hang in with me now. There's only five minutes left. Jim, you're the man. What are some open-ended questions? Well, an open-ended question would be going back to to clarify what aspects of delivery uh, is really do you, is it, central warehousing, explore the whole aspect of what hurts him in his delivery capabilities or his timeliness and try to Excellent. clarify Excellent. So, so, Christopher, tell me more about, these, about your concerns around delivery. Tell me more about them, what your experience been in the past, how have you handled this in the past, any questions we can get to get him talking more about it because – I know you know this, but you know when the customers come out with an objection initially, in the end it rarely looks like the same objection. But we make the mistake of they said this in the beginning, and so I'm going to hold on to it until I can beat it to death. So we need to simply ask questions to understand more about it. The one thing you want to make sure that you don't do is you want to make sure that you don't start clarifying too early because we, we saw what happens even if you're doing it from an innocent place. If the first time Chris said, I'm concerned about your your ability to deliver, if I would have right off the bat asked him, well, what are your concerns about that, it could send a message to him or he may feel challenged and feel like he needs to justify his position on what the issue is, and we don't want that to happen. Through the clarification process, and thank you, Jim, for participating, through the clarification process, we are going to find out that the obje- what the objection is. In other words, is, it, is Christopher's objection, is it coming from a place of indifference, is it skepticism, is it misunderstanding, or is it a smokescreen? The resolution for each of these is actually different, and if you try to resolve one of them in another way, it's not going to work. So what do I mean by that? Sometimes somebody is going to come out off and they're going to say, gosh, you know, this is a lot of money. I hear that one. And boy, have I learned the hard way. The best thing is just to feedback them and to say, you know, it is a lot of money. Because you know what? Some of the times when I say that, they go, yep, I guess that's just what it's going to cost to get this done. So the best response to indifference is simply acknowledgement. On the other isolation and clarification process, it sounds like there's skepticism. The person's probably going to need some proof. If it's a misunderstanding, sometimes it is that they misread something or don't understand what we're talking about, then they're going to need information to clear that up. If it's just another smoke screen, we've got to continue to isolate and clarify. We're ready to go into step number four, which is re- and as I've talked about before, we need to keep the so This is the point where we ask them to show you, you know, what can I do all the time? All the time with objections, we say, customer strike those words from your vocabulary. Customer service, sure, but now what can I do to fix this for you? on yourself, and you're also, what do you do instead? Here's great. You handled it in the past when? I had a customer, and this is a tr- I had a customer who we were way down the path business with me, and late one phone rang. I never should have answered it. He's the vice president of sales for a Thank you so much, but we why aren't you going to go with me? And he said, well, and I said, our price is too much. I did ignore He said, yes, this other company that we're talking about company, and they're also giving us books and tapes. And the first thing I did is I started going, well, Russ, how many books and tapes do you have sitting on your stuff and and guess what he did? Continued down that path because I challenged him. Said, "Well, it doesn't matter. Reading them or not, they're in them, and you're not." I started myself. All of a sudden, it was like, like I just I thought, "Wait a minute, I need to back up." And I said, All right, second. Other than that, what are your on our program and what we're going to do in the for your needs?" 
He said, I think you're really. Why is that? And he said, my program was more effective. We only budgeted. Now look what it went from. It went from they have books and tapes and you two. I did X amount of dollars for this, charging me X plus. To which I responded, Vice President of Sales, large logistics company. Situation before. How have you handled making a business decision? And in the solution that was the right one, it was for you. And I just shut up then. And his response, of course, was very um, You teach my salespeople how to do that. And we, of course, I've been in that circumstance before. You can ask them. I'm not suggesting it. Of course, you're not selling sales. Ask them. Because here's the thing. I expected. Oh, my goodness. First, let me put it this way. Raise your hand. Have ended up spending a penny more than they does. So what are some other questions we can ask the resolution process? We can ask, what can I do? What would you do in order to see and give you what you need? Okay. I'd like to go from here. Simply after you've clarified. As you're asking clarifying questions and they're talking resolution. So where would you like to go from here? I have no idea. Or I actually it okay to offer them a however, here's the way you do it have done when they found themselves in the same situation. Then you give them the solution and you ask them, what are your thoughts on that? What you don't want to do is say, well, let me tell you what to do. You actually want to want to offer the resolution as something that other people have done in case they don't feel it would work for them. So now, Chris and I, if you can hang on just about, I know it's at the end of our time, but we're almost there. We're it all sounds. Chris, go ahead and so we need to get this done pretty quickly, and I'm not sure that HP can respond as fast as, say, Dell can. So you need to get this done quickly, and you want to be certain that HP can respond fast. Right. We need to move while we have the budget and the executive support that we have now. It's all about striking when the iron's hot. You, Christopher, let's assume for a moment that you knew, that you had confidence that HP could respond as quickly as you needed. Based on our conversations, how well do you think these recommendations meet your total business needs? Well, you've done a great job in addressing our needs from a solutions perspective, and I appreciate the time you spent understanding our business needs and not just our computing needs. Tell me more about that. Well, in the past, we focused on acquisition costs to a fault. I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm looking for the best price I can get. That said, sometimes we can be short-sighted by not looking at the whole picture like we are now. So I've noticed a higher awareness to total cost of ownership myself with my customers, too. Let's, let's talk about what your needs are to strike while the iron's hot. We have the support to do this now. Whoever we go with has got to be able to move quickly, and I'm concerned about H HP's product availability. Why is that? Well, I've heard from people who know about this project that HP will make promises and not follow through. So, Christopher, what do you need to see or hear to feel comfortable that we will do what we say we will? Two things I can think of right now. One would be to talk to, or one would be to talk to some similar customers who have recently worked with you on this scale of a project. Secondly, a detailed written project plan, not some boilerplate cookie cutter, you know, something specifically for us with due dates that we can confirm and stay on top of. So, folks, let me hear from you. Who came up with a solution, and what's likely to happen next? And you know what? I'm not going to hear from you because we don't have a lot of time. But notice, Christopher came up with a solution, and human beings are funny. We like our own solution better, way better, than we like other people's solutions. So let me sum up some of the things we talked about today and send you off with some fun. First of all, use those competitive inquiries that you hear early on in the sales process. Use them as an opportunity to enter into discovery. And you can do that by acknowledging and redirecting the responsibility for the objection where it belongs, with the objector. Don't take the responsibility and hold it yourself. That process, you've got to practice it. Acknowledge, isolate, clarify, and resolve. So here's your home fund. Remember home fund? This is your opportunity to apply what you've learned. 
first of all, listen for competitive inquiries and practice to acknowledge and redirect. It's a great, a great way to do this is on the telephone. A lot of these uh, initial types of um, competitive inquiries happen over the telephone. Get, print out the workbook. You'll see some sample questions. Write them on an index card. Keep them in front of you and be prepared to acknowledge and redirect. Review the four steps for responding to objections. Make yourself a cheat sheet. Write on it, you know, acknowledge, isolate, clarify, respond. Write perhaps the isolation questions. You can copy those out of the workbook as well. Keep those in front of you. Here's something that I found to be real effective for people who want to adopt this into their sales process, but it feels overwhelming. Pick one step a day and commit to using it at office as, po as often as possible. Use it on your dog. Use it on your kids. Use it on your wife. Use it with your customers. If it's going to be acknowledged, then acknowledge, acknowledge, acknowledge. I had one guy, the sales guy, he'd been in sales for like 20 years. He also was the president of a little league that he worked in. And there was a, a customer, this was around the time that they were picking players, this was in the spring, and a customer. He had, he had another a, a parent call him, and it was all, another coach was all upset about the fact that a certain kid had been picked. And he said it was awesome. He said he acknowledged like three times and the issue went away. The guy said, you know, this isn't fair because so-and-so got to pick first and blah, blah, blah. And he said, I would have tried to explain it to him. Instead, I just said to him, you're really concerned about how the process went for picking. And he said, yeah, and furthermore, blah, blah, blah. And it was funny. The guy's name was Mike. He said, all I can remember was, it was acknowledge. He said, so I just kept on doing it. And pretty soon the guy said, well, thanks a lot for the conversation. Goodbye. And it was done. So pick one step and commit to using it. Role play the process from beginning to end with a buddy. You've got to practice this. All right, leave me with this. What valuable information or skill have you gained from participating in this training? And further, apply what you've learned. Let me hear from a couple of you, and then we'll tell you who's won to earn the most money so far. Who's still with us? John. John, who's not done leadership selling skills yet, so I want to hear from you. Well, I think the the most attractive thing to me is I'm not totally sold on this, so we'll see how it works in the field, is um, not or fighting the initial urge just to try to overcome every objection by taking ownership for resolving it and instead pushing it back at the customer and asking what ideas they have, what they've done in the past, and just more understanding and validating the objection, kind of the kernel of what we talked about here. Okay, and what part are you not, not yet sold on? Well, I, I fear that using this tool too much may seem evasive, mm -hmm. and the customer will get to a point where no matter what you ask them, you seem to parrot back a very refined response that asks for more detail. When, and I think it's a subtle difference of when you do take ownership, when you do realize this is a true barrier as opposed to an objection. And, uh, and you have to take ownership because the customer is going to buy from the company that makes their job the easiest and they are most successful with. Absolutely. So, so I, if I, we I, spend too much time pushing back on them and our competition says, hey, I'll do it, uh, you're right, there's fool's gold, there's other things out there, but right, I think right. you have to so, develop that expertise. So keep this in mind also as you move forward. This is um, this process is not something that you probably are going to use over and over again, meaning, you know, you, uh, hopefully you're not in a conversation where you're getting five objections in a row. That when something comes up, and I would most recommend that we do this, when, when you as a salesperson feel your defensiveness and stuff coming up, that's when it's most important to take a deep breath and feed it back to them, to provide some objectivity. And certainly there are going to be times when there are questions or things that you need to pay, take responsibility for if you made a mistake or something like that. I'm also not suggesting that we don't take responsibility for working with the customer. What I'm saying is that philosophically I don't believe that it's, it's your responsibility to fix it for them. So that said, I appreciate um, your your input and willingness to give this a try. So, folks, Christopher, who are our big money winners? Well, Mr. Nicewick and Mr. Phillips, the entire team comes out ahead in the end. Congratulations, yes. John, with six bucks. Whoa, wow. That's for the, that's, my gosh, that means that you could get, let me see, if you only got a grande latte at Starbucks, you might have enough left over for a bagel. But no problem with it. <laughs> Thank you all so much for your participation. I appreciate it, and I look forward to seeing you the same day and time next week.